morning. <laughs> Let's try that again. Good morning. Oh, there you are. Good. The sun is shining. It's good to be alive. Uh, we're continuing in our series in Matthew, and uh, didn't Sarah do a phenomenal job uh, last Sunday just talking about the whole process of confrontation and reconciliation? And that we're continuing on in chapter 18 this morning, and, and it begins like this in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister? Good question. Good question. Who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he, his wife, and children, and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. Then the servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, he grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. See if this sounds familiar. Be patient with me. I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Well, this is just a terrifying passage. Like, what are we to make of this? And uh, last week, we, we, we talked about how to confront someone who sins against us. And Matthew 18 is the cardinal rule for our community. Like, if someone does something that, uh, that sins against you, the goal is to go and start a conversation with that person. But Jesus' last word on the issue of discord is, is not confrontation. His last word is actually forgiveness. So the question is, what are the appropriate limits of forgiveness? Like, can forgiveness get out of hand? Don't people get away with things that they shouldn't get away with if we forgive them? And so Jesus begins to address these series of questions. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but forgiveness is really hard when we're trying to forgive someone else. And then forgiveness seems very easy when we're asking them to forgive us. Have you noticed? Why can't you just forgive me? Like, what's, what's the big deal? Well, the context once again, is this idea of reconciliation. What to do if your brother sins against you? And what do you do if your brother doesn't apologize? What do you do if it seems like the apology is not authentic? How are we to think about these things? And so Jesus actually introduces us to his concept of forgiveness. Now, there are concepts of forgiveness in our world, and quite honestly, I think in just about every religion of the world, but Jesus' concept of forgiveness is actually quite different. For example, in Buddhism, Buddhism teaches forgiveness, but it teaches forgiveness based on the idea that evil is an illusion. It's not real. And then as soon as you realize that it's not real, you can forgive someone. Uh, Judaism and Islam teach that forgiveness is made available when someone repents. And so there's no forgiveness until 
there is the request for, or, or, or there is repentance. But if there's no repentance, there's no forgiveness. And in Hinduism, the concept of karma, like if you do good things, you get good consequences. If you do bad things, you get bad consequences. There's no forgiveness there. There's just, you pay it back. If it takes a lot of lifetimes, that's what's going to happen. And Jesus teaches a very different concept. Like even in Mark, the 11th chapter, he says this, when you are praying, when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. The point of Jesus' story is to never give up on anyone. That's the point of forgiveness. You never give up on anyone. Now, the rabbis in Jesus' day actually had a common teaching, and the common teaching was that you would forgive someone three times. It was a three-strike leak, right? Three times, three strikes, and you're out. And they based this on a passage out of the prophet Amos, which says, for three sins, even four, I will not relent. So they took that to mean that God would forgive three times, but the fourth time, that's it. You're going to be held accountable. And Peter's actually being generous. If, if it is three times you're supposed to forgive, he doubled it and then added one on. Should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me seven times? And Jesus responds, not seven times, 77 times. Now, uh, this is, it's a little bit complicated, but these numbers are actually not chosen by accident. Now, you can go all the way back to the, the stories of human beginnings and, and, one of, and the single first murder ever created in human history was an act of fratricide. Uh, one brother killed another brother. Cain killed his brother Abel. And uh, after uh, God held uh, Cain accountable for his actions, uh, a couple things occurred. One is he took away the option of agriculture as his vocation, and he also drove him from the land that he was in. And Cain's response to God was, this is far too great a burden for me to bear, and it actually makes me a target, and now someone else is going to kill me. And God responded by saying, well, if anybody tries to seek vengeance against you, then I will visit on them sevenfold, seven times the vengeance that they take on you. Now, as it turns out, Cain had a great, 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 great grandson, I think. His name was Lamech. And Lamech is the first human in human history to actually have more than one wife. So he, he, he practiced polygamy. He had two wives. And there's a story in Genesis that's really interesting. He comes and brags to his wives, which is just an, that whole dynamic. You could do a whole uh, uh, psychological treaty just on that alone. He comes and brags to his two wives about a young man who wounded him, and he killed him. And this is what he said. He said, someone who, who would go after Cain, they would be uh, visited seven times the amount of vengeance that they brought. But if anybody comes after me, it'll be 77 times. What's this, what's that a picture of? It's a picture of unlimited revenge. That's the picture. And Jesus is teaching us that actually revenge should be limited and forgiveness should be unlimited. That's the context. That's the context. So Jesus is trying to help us understand if, if, if this is what vengeance looks like, this is what forgiveness should look like. So throughout history, uh, in stories and in movies, uh, in books, you usually find it's common that a hero of the story has had some great evil committed against him or against someone that he loves. And then what does he do? He goes out and seeks vengeance. And, and, and we cheer that hero on, don't we? I mean, when Liam Neeson says he has a very particular set of skills, <laughs> and he will find you, and he will kill you, a little shiver goes down our spine, and we go, oh, that's good. The bad guy is going to get his. We like that. And Jesus actually taught that it's more heroic to conquer revenge than to take it. It's a very different model. Now, Jesus is not saying that nothing matters. 
There are some people who misunderstand the teaching of Christianity that because there's grace, that what we're saying is nothing matters. Uh, dear ones, if nothing matters, you don't need grace. You just accept it as it is. Grace is for when evil has been done, when sins have been committed, when people have stepped out of bounds, when moral codes and laws have been broke. That's what grace is for. So grace and, and the teaching of Jesus is not whatever you do is fine, nothing matters. It is that when you step outside of those bounds, there is an option of forgiveness from our Heavenly Father. How many here in the house today and online are super glad that there's an option for forgiveness? Amen? Yeah. By the way, if somebody comes to you and they say, just so you know, I forgive you, when we, haven't, when we think we haven't done anything wrong, that just ticks us off. <laughs> Have you noticed that? So we, we struggle with this idea of, of, of forgiveness just in humanity in general, but also in the Christian faith. That's why Jesus uses the story. He's, he's a master storyteller, and he unpacks in a single story, things that would take volumes and volumes just to delineate in terms of doctrinal truth and, and uh, concepts. And everything in the story is, is disproportionate. Like the size of the debt, is, it's just unbelievably large. And then, and then the size of the forgiveness, it, it's incalculable. And then the size of the heartlessness of the servant after he's forgiven so much and goes out, that, that just seems incredible. And then the size of the punishment that comes back to that guy. And, and so what kind of terms are we talking about? Well, it says a silver coin. A silver coin was a, a typical day's wage. The, the term that's used in, in the Greek language is denarii. And so if you worked all day, your payment would be a denarii. Right? So if you worked 365 days, what would your payment be? Look at all the math people in the room. You, you, that's good. Now, a bag of gold... That was worth 20 years of a day's wage. 20 years of working. So 20 years times 365 is? <laughs> Proof that we have no math people in this service right there. So a bag of gold was 20 years of day's labor and 10,000 bags of gold. You ready for this? It represents 200,000 years of labor over 73 million days. In case you don't know, you will not live that long. So the point is not the amount of the debt. The point is that the debt is unpayable. There's no way. When the, when the servant says, be patient with me, unless he plans on living over 94 million days, it's not going to be a paid debt. And this is why Jesus brings this point home to us. The debt we owe God, we cannot pay. And here's the challenge, is that there are, there's a whole model, and it's in most religions of the world, is that if I do a good thing, I build credit up, and then when I do a bad thing, I just apply the credit. And as long as I do more good than bad, when I stand before God, he'll kind of weigh the scales. And even if it's close, as long as there's even one good thing more than a bad thing, I'm in. Here's the challenge. It, it's a way of thinking, and it, it's, a, it's a wrong-headed way of thinking. When we do good things, that's the way we're supposed to live. We don't get credit for that. That's how God intended humans to treat each other. That's how we're supposed to act. You don't get paid for that. that. That's what we're supposed to do. You're not building credit. You're actually living like you're supposed to. So when you do the bad, what do you have to offer towards it? And the answer is nothing. Our sins, well, somebody says, well, I'm not as bad a sinner, sinner as somebody else. Okay, I'll grant you that. You're probably not. I'm not sure I want to get into who's the worst sinner contest, but let's suppose that uh, you're just an amateur in the sinner department. <laughs> like you are, you, you are, no one's going to notice you very much at all. So the question is, what are you going to pay those sins off with? You have no capital. You have no collateral. You have nothing. You can lose an entire house for $1,000 if you don't have it. 
And this is the point that Jesus is driving home. We don't have the ability to pay. And the servant in Jesus' story, he goes to the king and he just says, please have patience. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. He asks for patience. He never would have been bold enough to ask for forgiveness. Just give me patience. I will pay it off. And, and he couldn't imagine that the response of the king would be, I will forgive the debt. He's completely released. He's released, listen to this, he's released of the responsibility of the debt. He is not released of the responsibility of having been forgiven. That's something else. So the newly forgiven servant goes out, happens to come across a fellow servant who owns him 100 silver coins. 100 days of, not a, it's, it's not nothing but it's not billions of dollars either. And what does he do? He grabs that servant by the throat and he's choking him. And he says, you pay me the debt right now. And that servant says the exact same thing that he said, be patient. I will pay back everything. And he says, no. And he has him thrown in jail until the debt is paid. And now all the other servants of the king noticed this, and they thought that that was unjust, and that was unacceptable, and they were outraged. And so they go tell the king about it, and, and the king has quite a response. Amazing grace releases us from our debt and enables us to release others. Psalm 103, David would put it like this. He would say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of your sins. We have a God who not only can and will, but has forgiven every single one of our sins. That's a good reason to bless the Lord. What do you think? Yeah? So how can believers who've experienced that kind of forgiveness become hard-hearted? This servant has no appreciation for the forgiveness, but he also has no fear of the king's judgment. Our forgiveness does not earn our salvation. Our forgiveness is a consequence of our salvation. We're not saved because we forgive someone. We're able to forgive because we're saved. God has forgiven us. We don't earn it, but we can forfeit it. Jesus teaches us that that, that kind of that level of forgiveness, that level of grace actually transforms us. It doesn't just change our eternal destination. It actually changes our relationships. It changes our ethics. It changes the way we go about life. Because we have received forgiveness, we now have something to offer someone else. So the servant when the king calls him and he says, you wicked servant, isn't it interesting? He never called him wicked because of his debt, but he did call him wicked because of his revenge. You are a wicked servant. I had mercy on you. How could you not have mercy on another? So why don't we like to forgive? And, and one thing is, is that unforgiveness makes us feel morally superior. This is the thing. It's happened to me, so I'm pretty sure it's happened to you, right? This is something we tell ourselves, and maybe we even tell them. I never would have done that to you. That's exactly what self-righteousness sounds like. And we feel so superior and so powerful. I, I would never have done that to you. We look down on the wrongdoer. You, it is very difficult to forgive someone you're looking down on. That's what self-righteousness does. And we feel powerful while we refuse to forgive. And it takes resentment, which is a very bitter taste, but it converts it into something that tastes better because what we feel is justified. Now, if I act in some way towards them, I feel justified. And we all like how justified tastes. And, and we refuse to, to forgive the person who has hurt us. It's very hard to forgive a person you feel superior to. 
We have to remember a couple of things. Number one is the person who hurts you is not less human than you are. Number two, you are not less of a sinner than they are. And if we forget either of those two things, we will act in inhuman ways because we will treat people less than human. And Jesus has come to remove that as an option from people who follow him. So how can we become a forgiving person? Good question. Let's see if we can tackle that in the next uh, couple minutes. Uh, first of all, to focus on what Christ has done for us. And I'll actually uh, call our worship team out. Focus on what Christ has done for us. The cost has been incalculable. We sang about it this morning. Jesus just doesn't come and say, you need to forgive. Jesus comes and shows us what forgiveness looks like and the forgiveness that he's offered us. And the result is, is that now we have something to think about that helps us offer something that we wouldn't have done otherwise. Have you noticed there's not a lot of forgiveness stories in our culture anymore? We dehumanize and we demonize. We draw lines in the sand and we, we pick sides and we hurl just about anything we possibly can at somebody else. But Jesus doesn't just call us, you should forgive. What he says is, remember the forgiveness you've received. Paul would talk about it like this in Colossians 3. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive. But it doesn't stop there. As the Lord forgave you. Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just just as Christ and God forgave you. Forgiveness. When we fail to forgive, this is our fear. If I do forgive, bad things are going to happen, but we never do the math. What kind of bad things happen if I don't forgive? What about justice? Please understand that trying to seek justice without forgiveness only leads us to vengeance. Our world is all about self-actualization. How can you become the true you? How can you identify who you really are? How can you live out who you really are? It's all about self-actualization, and Christianity is not about that at all. That's one of the great frustrations regarding Christianity. Jesus said, take up your cross and deny yourself. It's about self-denial, and here's the thing. When you take suffering and you add self-actualization to it, you get vengeance. But in Christianity, when you take suffering and you add self denial to it, you get forgiveness. Forgiveness. That's what he's called us to. So how do we do this? Name the wrong. Forgiveness is not pretending nothing happened. Name the wrong. Forgiveness is not making excuses. Name the wrong. Well, you know, I guess if I were in their shoes, I'd, I'd have done the same thing. Name the wrong. Secondly, decide not to hurt back. Well, I just don't feel like forgiving, and I feel like a hypocrite if I'm saying I'm forgiving, because inside, I hate their guts. If you wait until you feel like forgiving, you never will. But if you forgive, your feelings can change. It starts by making a commitment, a decision. Your feelings can follow forgiveness. And then love. Well, what does that mean? And our world has the screwiest concepts of love than you can possibly imagine. Real love doesn't make it easy for a person to continue sinning because you care about them. Not just the cost it took from you, but if they keep on their path, that path, things are going to get bad. So for example, let's say you have a spouse that's physically abusing another spouse. What's the Christian way to handle that? And there's a lot of people who've lived through unbelievable hell because the church didn't know how to answer that question. And the answer is, you forgive the offending spouse and you call the police. Well, that's not forgiveness. That's not true. If that person continues on that path, what is going to come of their life and all the people they interact with and what's going to be handed down for generations? And so you forgive the person. I'm not going to hurt you back, but I am going to bring accountability into your life with someone that you don't have a choice about accountability with. 
And why do you do that? Not because you're trying to hurt them, but because you're trying to help them. God of forgiveness and justice. He's both. He's forgiving and he's just. And if you only see God as a forgiving God, you will act like a spoiled child. And if you only see him as a righteous judge, you will act like an abused child. But how many are glad that when he's both, we can be his children and enjoy all the blessings and benefits that flow from him. Would you stand with me this morning? It's such a powerful message that Jesus included it in the prayer that we've all learned to pray. And I'm putting it up on the screen so we can say this out loud and together. But when we get to the part where it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, let us remember that because of his forgiveness to us, we can offer it to others. Let's all pray this prayer out loud and together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.